We welcome you back for the very last panel of today before Josh delivers his closing comments. And this one is on founders. It's the founders panel where we look into the future for fintech. And I have the pleasure of introducing you to Zain Malhas, Chief Executive Blink. Please come on stage. Waleh Dasona, Founder and Chief Executive Value. Please come on stage. Jad Sayek, Co-Founder and CTO, Sarva. Please come on stage. And finally, Russell Kamar, Co-Founder, Executive Chairman, Group Chief Executive, Pedi. To start off with, uh, no preface is needed. This is where we look into the opportunities, strengths, and the worries of fintech founders. And we look at the trends, technologies, and transformative shifts that define the way fintech either survives on its own and prospers or interacts with traditional financial services or bypasses them altogether. So before I start more formal sections, I'd like Russell to sort of set the scene. And if I could ask you, what exactly has the COVID-19 pandemic changed for fintech and fintech founders? There was a massive acceleration to digitalization, which is well documented. There's a lot of research and data around that. Uh, but what, what exactly has changed, if you could pinpoint that? And how is this phenomenon progress, progressing across the Middle East? I know you have a global gaze on many of these things. So if you could maybe provide some comparative okay. views. Yeah, sure. So thanks, everybody, for sticking around for the penultimate session. It's nice to see all the friendly faces out there. Um, look, I, COVID, I think in general, it, it, in our business, just so you understand, um, you know, I, I, we built the sort of largest BNPL player in Japan. And, and as you say, I'm an investor in, in different fintechs in the region. I think COVID was very important in terms of accelerating kind of digital transformation around commerce and payments and other things, which I think really helped a lot of kind of you know, e-commerce and, and, and some other different stuff. Contactless payments for in-store things, obviously also accelerated by that. In, in our business, we saw a really big adoption of switching to where in a Japanese context, uh, there was still a lot of cash on delivery or uh, in-store purchase using cash, actually a, a much more accelerated shift to online shopping. And then our payment method actually, which is contactless and you, you don't need to interact with a delivery person, but you can still settle with cash kind of as a replacement for a credit card. Uh, that it really kind of drove adoption. There's obviously been a little bit of a, a, of, um, a kind of a, you know, return to in-store. Everyone is all happy with all of that. But I think what has stuck with people is, you know, if you have these digital experiences that are better than the analog experience that has, has replaced, I think it was an opportunity for, for all of the fintechs in the world to kind of, um, at least if you addressed that use case, to get people to do first uses. And then obviously, if you really thrilled them and they stuck with you in the subsequent years, uh, I think it was, a, you know, it, it sort of in retrospect, kind of this great opportunity to, to get in front of a lot of people. Um, and I think that that was true elsewhere. And, and, and you know, again, sort of thematically, uh, if you look in, in other different places, just this digital transformation around payments, around shopping, um, and uh, certainly in this region around delivery of government services, all of those things are only just going to continue because it's just so much easier than the old kind of analog way. And I say that from the country that still uses fax machines. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, nice to see all of this accelerating. Thank you for those opening remarks. And now moving on to the first formal section, which is titled Regulatory Insights from Founders. And, uh, you know, um, Zain, if I could start with you. And how would you say, in general, regulations are affecting <clears throat> fintech today? I mean, they've always been something fintechs have to contend with. Are regulators facilitating and supporting and nurturing fintech? Or are they actually uh, maybe inadvertently ending up hindering their growth? And what more needs to be done from their end? Thank you. This is actually a very important question and always top of mind uh, because there's this perspective that regulators are actually an opposing force to growth and digitization. Um, I tend to disagree with this notion uh, from experience and from how I'm seeing things and mainly two reasons. Uh, one, regulatory um, uh, pressures are, are never affecting really one player in the market. They're, they're really affecting all players equally. Uh, and two, because there are uh, common interests with regulators always. So we're seeing regulators really trying very hard um, to educate themselves. Uh, they're focusing always on financial inclusion, on digitization, uh, trying to support really fintech um, 
passing laws that would support such as open banking that has been really popular in the region. Maybe different countries have different levels of, of, of progress with that, but we are seeing that interests are really <coughs> aligned. Uh, of course, there is a lot of room for development in this area, primarily primarily in the collaboration between players in the market and the regulators. So that maybe we're not seeing happening as 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 good as it should be. Um, so. Uh, um, uh, this, although it is, it's really key to driving this forward. So I'll give an example from Jordan. Uh, the regulator is actually send, circulating draft uh, uh, regulations in draft form to solicit feedback and comments from players, which we have seen to be very useful to uh, to allow us to collaborate and discuss. So um, we really need to see that shift from uh, regulators being um, reactive and rather a bit more proactive, and that's when we, we will see the positive impact. Thank you for those comments. Uh, turning to you, uh, Walid, um, we often hear the need for interoperability. What is the level of interoperability that you see across the region in general? Uh, perhaps not MENA, but maybe Middle East, uh, when it comes to fintech uh, regulations. And do you see convergence happening in the near term within the region itself? Or you think a global standard, a minimum standard needs to be imposed after negotiations and that will actually reset the rules of the game? So uh, in Egypt, uh, we're, we're trying to focus on financial inclusion. So this has been the model for the past 10 years, I think. And uh, of course, COVID helped a lot with change in the regulations and change in the landscape. And also uh, because we have different, uh, different fintech regulators in Egypt, this gave us a, a wider option to try to innovate. So the central bank is there but we have what we call the Financial Regulatory Authority that is mostly c covering everything in fintech other than payments. And with, with this, it was very important to have interoperability between many players, but it always started as partnerships. So what we, what we see that now there is, when they started on the money on wallets of telcos, it was actually a closed loop between the same telco provider. On the other hand, uh, in COVID, they had to open interoperability between different players. And then payment companies like PayMob and PayTabs and Fowry, what they started to do, they started to do what we call Connect, which is similar to Click, for example, in Jordan. So now you can transfer money between one wallet in a bank to another wallet in a telco and from one telco to another. And this has helped a lot in the, in the change of the landscape. It helped also people like us who are providing financing that with one click, we can push the money that we want to any of our customers on their preferred payment thing. And after having Misa, which is our um, local switch, this has increased interoperability again because on that basis, they started having with the Instapay, which is the Venmo of the Egyptian market. So now you can transfer money from one bank to another bank at any point in time instantly. Currently, it's free because it's subsidized by the central bank, but definitely it's the Venmo of, of Egypt right now. Everyone can transfer money, not only to a bank account, but also to prepaid cards, debit cards, and credit cards, and you can pay bills with it, and you can transfer this into a wallet, uh, any kind of wallet of the four telco, uh, telco operators in Egypt. So definitely, I think we are one step away from a full open banking system in, in Egypt. I understand, of course, that countries like Bahrain Bahrain are very advanced in that. Uh, countries like um, Saudi and UAE are in the process. But despite the fact of the absence of our open banking, most of the use cases that are important, other than underwriting a customer and having a, a view on their statement, is already there in Egypt with the absence of open banking. Uh, thank you. Um, Jared, I mean, if you could give us now the founder's perspective. How are fintech founders navigating this complex regulatory landscape with, you know, interoperable standards and open banking? And how do you think this is going to redefine their interactions with traditional finance? Yeah, I mean, I think the, uh, the experience has been very similar to what Zayn mentioned earlier. Um, for instance, for us, we operate in the UAE and our regulators are the ones in the UAE. And one uh, dynamic or myth that was busted earlier on was around um, having regulators be kind of a hurdle for innovation. But we found that when, uh, when regulators take a cooperative approach, that actually ends up being the opposite. Because especially in fintech, there's a lot of, uh, actually one of the hurdles for fintechs is, is, uh, is the gray zone of not knowing 
where something where something can happen, uh, which is usually where innovation is, but not knowing what the uh, not having rules that are adapted actually for the use case. And um, when cooperation happens, which is, for instance, uh, in the UAE, that took the form of um, the innovation testing license, the DFSA in Dubai issued that. That was, uh, you know, what Sarwa graduated out of. And that allowed us to essentially pioneer things like all digital onboarding. So that created an environment where all of a sudden that gray zone gets uh, cleared out and you're able to invest in a way of operating in a use case and you're able to innovate uh, with a clear conscience. So uh, I think regulators can, you know, definitely have a very strong input on that front. But it comes with, with challenges, especially in today's environment where uh, you're in a strong enforcing, uh, you know, global environment. So I think it's a, it's a question of balance and uh, regulators that do that well, they, they will foster innovation. I mean, uh, we're now moving on to the next section. Thank you for those comments, Jad, on market transformation and operational strategy. So I'll come back to you, Zeen. I mean, how is fintech influencing market transformation in general? the entire financial services system. And is this going to lead not to the demise, but may ha perhaps fintech bypassing f traditional finance completely? Or are they going to coexist side by side for quite a long time? And this is definitely not the addition of, uh, not the end of plain vanilla finance. Definitely. Um, if you had asked me this question a couple of years ago, I would probably have a different answer, <laughs> especially since at the time fintech was such a, big deal and the buzzword. Yeah. Um, actually, that I've come across the best articulation of the impact of fintech while reading a book called The Innovator's Dilemma. And it acts, what it talks about is basically how the two principles that we learn in business school as, as a representation of good management, which are customer centricity on one hand, and allocate investing in innovations that promise the highest returns, are actually the two reasons why the greatest firms have failed. And therefore, it talks about this dilemma. And it goes about saying or differentiating between sustaining technology and disruptive technology, defining disruptive technology as being that of underperforming products and by adding features to them that are typically valued by an unconventional group of customers that are usually new. And these products are usually simple, smaller, um, convenient, and easy to use. So when I was going through that, actually one example came to mind, which is buy now, pay later. And we have two disruptors with us here on the panel. Um, so if you think buy now, pay later, there had always been easy payment plans attached to credit cards for ages. But then e buy now, pay later providers come along, they underperform this product, offer other features to it, giving you embedded finance, giving you the opportunity to access finance at a point of making a decision to buy something, yet simplifying the process, making it easier, more convenient to use. So this is really how I look at fintech today. It's just this convenience that comes with it. With that, I'd like to qualify also this by saying that there are also certain services that I don't think would ever uh, really be replaced by fintech, where we would need that kind of personal, uh, interaction. personal interaction. And it was discussed today through several yeah. panels. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're actually trying to bring a lot of the disparate threads that we've been discussing together. So turning to you, uh, Jad, I mean, in the past, we've seen uh, first bank and fintechs maybe beginning to compete then collaborating rather than competing with fintechs, actually augmenting banks' abilities, whether it's tech or customer acquisition. You see this trend likely to continue? I may be asking the same question that I've asked before, but in different packaging. Or you think that you see a completely new full-services fintech kind of emerging? Yeah, I mean, I think just looking at, first off, historically, um, the competition between banks and fintechs, uh, where that led was just banks realizing at some point that there's a lot of iteration happening that needs to happen there, that the agility that despite their resources, the agility that they needed to essentially get to a product market fit uh, was difficult to achieve and also a cannibalization that was happening with their own services. Um, but I think that's a dynamic that's evolved over the years, as you mentioned. Uh, part of it is uh, fintech has matured. So product market fit now that's become less of an uh, uncertain thing and banks can emulate that. So we're seeing banks enter the, you know, the competition again. We are seeing some collaboration. I think there's a, so there's a lot more diversity there. Uh, on the M&A side, you'll have 
for instance, in the wealth space, which is where we operate, um, recently uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, you know, acquired Nutmeg, which is um, the UK's biggest player in the wealth space. So you have that happening as a uh, as a, as a collaboration. But I think one of the uh, undermentioned, I think, dynamics in terms of how banks and fintechs are interacting today is you have banks, uh, fintechs, and this is maybe one of the chief criticisms that fintechs get is that they still operate on the banking infrastructure, right? And the innovation there, despite it, despite all the, the hype around it is not total. We're still in the same ecosystem and, and in the same financial system as traditional banks. And we operate with similar constraints a lot of times, of course, with much better uh, user experience and servicing a larger base. Uh, and the banks that I found come out winning out of this are banks that position themselves as platforms for fintechs, uh, banks that become uh, API enabled banks that push uh, and ecosystems that push open banking. Uh, they capitalize on the fintech ecosystem. They make it so that uh, it, it becomes a shared value chain, essentially, because a lot of fintechs are still not vertically integrated and rely on that underlying banking element. And I think until we get to a point of decentralized finance where you know crypto takes over, which we'll see if that ever happens, uh, we're going to stay in that environment. And so I, I don't see one taking over the other. If anything, there might be more of a symbiotic relationship building. Actually, can I add to? Yeah, yeah, please. I, I think there's even like this um, this overarching theme, which is well, what is the role of fintech anyway? Like, why why do any of us exist? And I think you know, like, part of it is okay. Even if you don't have a friendly regulator, you should be doing the best that you can with the regulatory setup that you do have to get the consumer experience that you want. And that, at least in in my experience, if you start from the kind of consumer experience and where you want to deliver value, you can find a way to make it work even better if a regulator will work with you. But if they can't, you you do what you need to do. And I think that, at least for me, if you're going to contribute value to the ecosystem, it has to be either you want to take a risk that an incumbent can't. So in our in our business, it was this book of instant credit without doing credit files or you know any kind of checking like just running that book of risk or you have to be interested in a new consumer experience so again for us embedded in e-commerce rather than trying to do any kind of customer acquisition and and I, I think your point is just so well made which is you're not trying to displace people in a legacy experience with a legacy delivery of a legacy service you're looking to actually take these components parts that exist Part of them may be regulatory infrastructure, part of them is whatever banking, plumbing, all of these other things, and just recombining them with a little bit of, you know, whatever secret sauce uh, to, to kind of deliver more value into the ecosystem. And then, then you have a right to exist because you are contributing and taking things forward. So yeah, I, like, I just love what you say, but I think our role in the ecosystem is build new things if it's out of new parts, great. If it's out of old parts, fine. But just build new things and deliver new value that other people are not trying to do yet. And that's how you win. Sorry. Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to sort of switch gears at this point, though. I Actually, I think we can hold a panel just about this. But Walid, if I could ask you, you know, uh, there seems to be an increasing emphasis on profit profitability for founders across the world and startups. What is the key to profitability, whether it's a pure fintech play or a bank's digital operations or a digital spin-off? Uh, and how do you get there? You know, one uh, strategy, for example, probably the one that works best is effectively migrating customers up the value chain to higher value transactions in order to make operations sustainable. What's your take on this? Okay, I, th I, think, I think we have a good experience in that. We started our first day of operation on the 18th of December, 2017, and we broke even in December, 2018. So uh, 2019, so it took us two years to break even, and then we were able to move into profitability. Uh, I assume, I, I think this year, we're going to close with um, around $300 million of gross merchandise value, and this will create around $50 million of, um, of revenue and around $7 million of net profit. Uh, the thing, there are some tricks that you, we, we, it worked out for us. I don't know if we're going to work for the other people or not, but we were lucky enough that in our market for our business, it's very difficult to acquire commercial debt 
but we were luckily enough that we were able to acquire commercial debt for two reasons. The first reason is our model when started was not a strictly buy now, pay later. There are part of our financing was actually interest bearing. So this increased our margins a bit and enabled us to burn cash from to acquire new customers on zero interest offers. This is one thing. The second thing, we were able to acquire debt from uh, commercial banks at the time, which actually decreased our cost of funds significantly and enabled us to uh, have a net interest margin plus revenue that we can use to cover our expenses. And finally, we also had, um, and I'm talking here financially, then I'm going to cover the what we do with the life with the lifetime value of the customer and how we handle it, the, we were able to issue bonds, securitize bonds. So if you are able to issue securitized bonds, you are even hedging your re- interest rate risk because you're getting a, a variable interest rate from the cost, from the bank. But unfortunately, you have to sell with a fixed interest rate or zero interest to your customer. If you are able to securitize your bonds, then you have a better uh, a better hedging on this because when you securitize a bond, you can pick the bond could be fixed. So for, this is the financial part of it. So from financial, from f- the financial part, uh, we were able to hit profitability. The second thing is that uh, we had an understanding from day one, and we were lucky enough because we didn't have competition except after four years. So this gave us a good, um, uh, a, a good runway to start uh, actually achieving returns and trying the different things with the customer. So we understand that the customer will come to us for a hook, and the hook would be a very good offer, discounted price, or a zero interest. Our role in the grow, uh, with the growth team is to make sure that our customers come again and buy with things where we can make money. And to do this, we have increased our diversification that starts from a very small ticket like a grocery store and goes up to a flight ticket and then goes up to a, a, a car. So what we have done that we have a diversity for the customers. They are able to use our facility. And the most important part was to have a revolving credit limit, something that buy now, pay later in the region started doing 24 months after their inception. From day one, value was very, very, very cautious to make sure that we have revolving credit limits. So our approval cycle was a little bit longer, but we had to check credit bureaus, for example. It increases your cost, but decreases your customer acquisition on a transaction in the future. So when we are, we were able to provide revolving credit limits, it's an easier decision for the customer to come in and buy again. And then we started to give the customers experience. So if you are a value customer, you start getting some experience in some restaurants, in some air, uh, airlines and things like that. When you go up like this, you start competing actually with um, premier and wealth uh, and, and, and wealth services in the banks. So people start looking at buy now, pay later now as a, pre- as a, as a premium product rather than looking at it as affordability product only. So this is our case. I don't know if it works anywhere else, but we were lucky enough it works for us. Um, Russell, I just like to stay with this theme of profitability. Yeah. Uh, in the post-COVID uh, era, we've seen that the pre-COVID tendency of acquiring customers at any cost, sure. as long as you had cash to burn, as they say, that was the mantra. The new mantra is you have profitability from day one, or you have a clear path to profitability from day one. Otherwise, you know, we won't fund you, we won't back you, and so on. Has this paradigm changed for good, or in some yeah not so nearby future when funding costs come down again, as they inevitably will, you think we're going to go back to those old bad ways? I think everything goes in cycles. So, you know, I think it, you know, it like, and I obviously I invest in a bunch of different places. It's actually not bad that people have a little bit of discipline and that you, you know, that you, like you don't want to uh, not be able to do what's healthy for the business, but actually just being a little bit thoughtful about how you manage it is maybe not a disaster. I think there were a number of bad habits that came that people have probably graduated from. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing, but I, I do think that as you've hit on, there are these kind of cycles. And you know, for now, people, I, I think you know, multiples have come down, obviously all of, all of those other things, more of a focus on profitability, less on revenue growth, although if, you should still have that too, to be interesting, right? As I guess it's Paul Graham, like startups, your product is growth. That's what you produce. So you have to, you have to kind of do that. Um, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. I think that, you know, oftentimes all of the best companies that you can think of, you know, the, the Facebook famously, you know, all of these other ones that, that are kind of, uh, you know, even Bitcoin was 2009, right? Like when it's a little bit harder, basically, um, 
you you have to work a little bit more, but in general, people will build great businesses uh, in in the way that is maybe not the same when you know money is really free, and uh, anybody that you know is an ex Google or whatever can kind of kind of go do what they want to do. So I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. I, I think if founders that are really driven and on their own journey, this just becomes another part of the landscape that they're navigating. And if they're really, you know, if they really have the metal to to kind of go and 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 continue on their journey, they will. So we are now moving on to our very last section of the last panel of today, which is about fintech's broader impact, uh, investments, and new realities that you know founders are waking up to. So Jad, I'd like to kick off this segment by asking you, um, how are fintech founders adapting to a much tougher global funding environment compared to pre-COVID? And it's quite likely there are enough signs now that this new funding environment is likely to persist for a while, which you just spoken about. And you see certain trends uh, like generative AI, which can go against the grain and attract a larger chunk of the fundraising. Yeah, I mean, the the reality today is a, is a more tough funding environment. Uh, I think I'm going to build a lot on what Russell said, because uh, I sort of, you know, subscribe by that as well where I think uh, as, as innovators and in, in the startup ecosystem, you need adversity um, and you end up, uh, I think too much abundance, abundance is good at a, at a certain point in time, but at some point it becomes comfort zone and kills innovation and you need adversity to go into decisions that are a bit bolder, a bit more risky, uh, but might lead to a better business model. Um, I think when it comes to the funding environment, there's globally, there's a challenge, but that being said, there's a regional component to it as well. I mean, we're, we're, we're in a region that is, has a lot of growth happening for it right now, and that does attract a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of investment still, and that will continue to do so, I think. Um, in the early phases of the, um, of the downturn, there was a lot of funds that were staying in their home markets because funds wanted to make sure that their startups and their businesses were, uh, were watered enough. But I think that's, that's evolving. And when it comes to the uh, to AI, generative AI and, and the funds that go there, I think with the VC ecosystem, there ends up being moments. Uh, I think in 2019, every VC wanted to invest in delivery uh, applications. In 2021, uh, fintech, 2020, fintech was the big thing. And, you know, I think these moments happen. And one, uh, I guess, two points that come from it. First off is companies with good fundamentals get funding in the end. Uh, but the second one is, uh, at least I think the region um, took advantage of the moment that I had with fintech. So we have a lot of good players, strong players. I think we've uh, been through periods like these before. The dot-com bubble comes to mind. And what happens in these, in these cases is business models get better. Um, companies get leaner. They get more focused. Uh, and what comes out the other end is stronger companies. So I, I do believe we come up with a stronger ecosystem, as, uh, uh, as Russell said. And I guess more tactically, what that means is I think on the fintech side, you're just going to see more consolidation. Uh, that's sort of what happened to us. We used to be just in investing. Now we do investing, trading, crypto, uh, save. And a lot of that really comes down to, well, you're not going to grab a lot more market share because your marketing burn is down. So you're going to see how can I give more value to the customers that I have. And that's a good thing too, because clients, they don't want to use a million fintechs for their money, right? They want all their money in one place. They want to be able to manage everything in one place. And to a certain extent, that's a good thing. Yeah, I mean, Zain, could I have your perspective on this? I'd like to keep harping on that bit. You see some specific trends that, uh, you know, apart from the regional uh, issues or advantages that Jad has just mentioned, that are escaping this, like generative AI, which was at least in its initial days of massive growth, attracting a disproportionately large share of funding. You see any such trends or... Um, from at least for just reflecting on my own experience, because it's it's quite different when we look at Blink being a neo bank that is actually under the umbrella of a com commercial bank. So uh, so we we have an incumbent bank. So uh, the the view of what Blink is doing as far as the bank is concerned is is as if it's just a new venture 
for the bank rather than a startup or a fintech that is standalone raising funding. So from our perspective, um, although we are not necessarily looking at fundraising at this point, but we still need to, as, as Jad mentioned, we still need to make sure that we have the fundamentals to keep things going. So I think the biggest challenge would be more so in how do we monetize? How do we really uh, get maximize that return on investment in a, in a space that is still new um, one of the things that I've also come across uh, reading a couple of researches on this point is that um, basically it boils down to uh, we need for you to really be a first mover uh, and, and, and take advantage of that it means that you're taking the risk of acknowledging um, I don't have enough research I don't I cannot really build uh, a financial model and projections that I can really confirm that I will get this return on investment. So so it, it really boils down on being, as uh, again, as Jad mentioned, as iterative as possible, as agile as possible to keep testing and failing and failing fast for you to build that that the, the grounds that that would be uh, um, sustainable and where investors would, would funds would flow naturally because of that. Right. I mean, I think we now moving into a very last segment, which is about broader social purpose. So to start off, Walid, if I could ask you, how do you feel fintech is or is or can or could contribute to sustainability and ESG goals, and how might this create further transformative shifts for the entire corporate sector? Yes, I think this is a, one of the most important parts, especially in the developing countries. So when we talk about, it's definitely different uh, different countries between like Japan, UAE, Jordan, and Egypt. For us, it was a, a very clear thing that uh, our role needs to be part of all the AG, uh, achievements uh, or, or goals. And one of them was how to underwrite unbanked customers for providing them with access to finance. And uh, unfortunately, most of the models that are around the world on buy now, pay later, because it started like with Klarna, Afterpay, Tamara and Tabby, everyone was actually building their, their experience on a card. So if the customer doesn't have a credit card, a debit card, or a prepaid card, he's not able to start a transaction on a buy now, pay later. In Egypt, the penetration of cards was very low at the time we started in 2017. Actually, we didn't have our national scheme, so it was very expensive for anyone to carry a Visa or a MasterCard, whatever the kind of the card is. And we had to figure out that we don't want to go and compete with the banks only, because if we compete with the banks only, then it's a price war. And if it's a price war, they definitely have a cheaper cost of fund. So we had to go to the unbanked segment of, the, of those markets. And we had to find a way to underwrite those unbanked segments as part of our uh, as part of our commitment for the ESG, of course, but on the other hand, as a path to profitability, because you will not be able to acquire those customers at any point in time if you decide you want to go to bank customers only. So one thing that we have invested a lot in is to build models that are able to underwrite customers that doesn't have any bank account nor credit history. This is one thing that we started with, and we have done it well enough that our partnership with Uber, for example, providing partners who are using cars that they don't own, uh, don't own with loans to buy cars at a discounted price being held by, by the government was very important for us. And we started having data exchange with Uber for a good period of time. This is the same model works for in Nigeria, for example, which is a developing country like Egypt. And then this was one thing that we moved in. So we had built enough data to underwrite unbanked customers is one thing. Second thing is that we were very focused on was how to help with tuition fees because most of the people in Egypt, unfortunately, our public schools does not provide enough uh, a, a good, good education, unfortunately. So we had to try to help people with schools and how to get them into tuition fees. So we started building models around tuition fees, getting to understand the school requirements, getting to understand that we can increase the number of classes, we can increase the number of customers and things like that, if they can help us with affordability, if they can look at some kickback or returns that we can use to provide a zero interest and a longer tenure for anyone to go into, into their schools. And finally, one of the things that we have been building since inception was the use of clean energy. So we also started with residential houses and the need of 
clean uh, of clean energy. We started to provide financing for solar panels on longer terms. We got the help of uh, the World Bank and IFC on some of those in a subsidy way so that we can offer those at, uh, at, at, at a discounted price. And finally, we started to work also on hybrid cars and electric cars to try to help. There are a lot of other things that we have done that I can share, but uh, I don't want to leave some room for my colleagues here to explain how they do with ESG. Right. I mean, uh, thank you for those comments. I mean, I'm sure that uh, you could have gone on and all of them would have been interesting insights. But we are at the very end, at the very tail end of the day, and we are trying to wrap a social purpose angle around fintech. And uh, Russell, the very last question for today, sure. uh, the last question, so to speak. Uh, we had Zhao here uh, a while back, and you know, you perhaps weren't there during the session. But one of the things he did mention, specifically about crypto, is that you know, it was meant to solve specific problems. And there are lots of dreamy founders who believe that you can create a tool or a system or an ecosystem which solves all of the world's big questions and big problems. But um, how do you think fintech founders in particular, or fintechs, if you want to go a little broader, can raise their level of broader impact uh, while continuing to focus on profitability, which is the new imperative. And for example, you know, uh, the one straight away application that comes to mind is about inclusion, which many people have mentioned yeah. today, either on this panel or outside, uh, be because that leads to greater access to financial services and many other yeah. uh, social goods, so to speak. So what's your take on this possible impact that founders or fintechs in general just a little little tiny question just a, just an easy <laughs> throwaway one at the end right um, look I think I think two things right um, I think in general uh, business and capitalism for whatever reason is starting to get a bad name and I don't think it should I think it's a tremendous force for good in terms of moving humans forward, right? All of us are innovating to, to try and do different things. Yours is about inclusion. There's other different things. Yeah, it, it, interestingly, even in a Japanese context, like our consumers all have credit cards. They just don't use them because they don't like them for cultural reasons. So we <laughs> built this whole new experience. Like they're so similar, we should be friends after this. So let's talk. But But from this force for good, I mean, just making people's lives better, period, is a very motivating thing, I'm sure, for everybody here. It's nice to build organizations and solve bigger problems, but like basically by contributing to the ecosystem, capitalism pays you back. You're allowed to then basically give productive work to people that work with you. You can be supportive to the partners that you work with in the ecosystem. And in general, you can make the world a little bit better, right? I mean, I don't want to sound like Silicon Valley, the, the TV show, make the world well, a better place. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. My guru is better than your guru, whatever. No, but in, in a very small way, you, you know, Everybody here is, I guess, culturally different, but actually culturally quite the same in terms of orientation. We want to solve problems for as many people as we can, contribute, you know, on the short time that we're all here, take care of our kids, grow society, grow the world, move everything forward. And actually, I, I think that, you know, business and a focus on problem solving and profitability and all of those other good constraints that mean that it really is meaningful right you, you you capitalism you won't be rewarded for something if you aren't actually giving value and if you are then you will be and it's self-sustaining and, and and it gets to keep go uh, going so i think for me the even the fintech I, just in general i would say you know, smart people working hard to solve problems for other people and build value in general is really powerful and is really moving humanity forward in an important way. And I think it gets a bad rap these days for whatever reasons. And we should really defend those values that are really important. And here in this region, I think people actually get that, that we want to make progress together by building ecosystems, by working together, by solving problems and, and, and building wealth that we all share in. And it's not just financial wealth, right? It's how we all get along. It's, you, you know, all of those good things. So for me, it's not fintech in general, but like all of us, the time that we spend doing this, hopefully is, uh, is worth it in a wider context, not just for ourselves. Right. I mean, I think we are completely out of time, but we have time for some questions from the audience if there aren't. If not, I do have a couple of questions. So, you know, or at least one question that I'd last, like to ask uh, people here. So any questions from the audience? Um, if not, I'm going to go and ask another question. Whoever wants to take this on, what is the one most exciting fintech idea or startup or founding situation or theme 
that catches your imagination today. Anyone wants to take that on, you know. Is it generative AI? Is it VR? We've discussed so many things today. Is there anything that you'd like to speak about? Any of you? So, yeah, I think this interaction, intersection between AI and crypto is going to yeah. be really powerful. And maybe the metaverse just have... Yeah, something like that. Yeah, but it, it's interestingly, all of these ideas that people got excited about in sequence, now we can get excited about all together and it probably unlocks... I think the sort of convergence of many of these critical... Yeah, I think it'll be fascinating to see. And then the the... These technologies are, by definition, at the start, kind of global in applicability, and that gets exciting. And then even back to this point about having regulators that are good at this, right? There are some regulatory regimes, Gary Gensler, who are kind of like not helping to foster that, and others that I think are a little bit more open-minded. And it will be interesting to see how and where these things develop on that basis. So I think that's super exciting. AI meets crypto. It is, yeah, sorry, I've, I've spoken enough. I think we're sort of completely out of time. Thank you, everyone, Thank for you. such a wonderful discussion. And if I could invite Josh back to stage for his concluding comments. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you. for coming. Thank you. Thank you for participating. Thank you.